Well, for those of you who weren't here last week, I wasn't either. And any time I take a week off, the next week is always a guarantee that I've got a lot to say. More so than normal. So prepare yourself. I don't even have enough room up on this pulpit for my notes this morning, if that says anything to you. But really this morning, I find myself so intrigued with what we're going to talk about today that really what I found myself doing was putting two, two messages into one. That's never good. But we're going to try to get through if we can. And we're talking about life lessons. Life lessons through people, through heroes of the Bible. And sometimes we think that, that the way that they live their life, people of faith in, in, in the times of Jesus, in the Old Testament, that these people just did it right all the time. You know, that they, they never made mistakes. That, that we just, if we just be more like them, we'd be perfect. And the, and the reality of it is we all know that that's not true. So what I hope to accomplish in these weeks to come, and we will take a small break because of Christmas, but we're going to talk about these life lessons through people's lives that we, that we have admired. And, and today I want to deposit some words in, into your heart. And I think they're words that, that have to be deposited. And I think that this message this morning really applies to every single person that's here today. Because I think that no matter where you are in your life, whether you're young or middle age or older, there's just something that is inside of you, it's inside of me that we all struggle with at least from time to time. And this morning I want to challenge you with, there are three words, but I'm going to say it four times. It's a question that's going to be asked throughout this entire message this morning. And I'd just like to ask, if you have your notes this morning, if you just take them out, if you, could, if, if, if you don't write anything else down it's in terms of remembering what's said today, I'd like to ask that you just remember these four words. And here they are. When is enough enough? That's the question that I want to ask you this morning. When is it enough? When is it that when you've got this or when you receive that or when you get to that point that you can say to yourself that enough is enough? And this morning, I don't want to get on the rampage of some things that I'm sure that some of you are thinking about. I'm not going to talk about more as being better in terms of as far as, as wealth goes financially. Because there's some of you who believe that, that you know what, if, if, I, if I receive a lot in this world, that God is blessing me. And so because I'm such a spiritual person and I've got lots of stuff, that God has blessed me. And so that's a good thing. Or maybe there's others of you who are on the other side who would say, but... But doesn't the Bible say that, the, that, the, that money is the root of all evil and that the less that we have, the better that we have? So if we are living in poverty, that means that we're more spiritual too? The reality of it is, and if I could just say to, to those of you who have heard that type of message periodically throughout your life, I just want you to know that both of those are wrong. <laughs> Because if you look at Scripture, you will find men, men like Abraham and Isaac and Solomon and David, men who were given so much wealth over their lives. I mean, these were the Fortune 500 type of people. And God honored them and God blessed them. And they, and they loved God and God loved them. But we also read about people in the Bible, too, who just barely was on the line. I mean, some of them didn't even have a place to lay their heads. And guess what? They weren't disobedient. They weren't walking away from God. God loved them, too. So this morning, I don't want to get wrapped up in this whole thing about, well, if you've got too much, then that's, you're not spiritual. Or if you're really in poverty, then you're right where God wants you to be. I don't want to talk about a prosperity preaching, and I don't want to talk about, well, if, you just have a, if you're just so destitute and poor, then you're right where God wants you. Because that's, that, that's not the truth of the matter either. And you've heard those messages growing up. I'm sure you have. This morning, I want to talk about something that I think is so very important. There are those that I think that are going to be here today where I think the Lord is going to say to you and to I, it's not a matter of whether or not you have a lot or that you have less, but it is a matter of the heart. Because at the end of the day, it's not that you're here and you have an abundance that makes you where God, what God wants you to be. And if you're here today and if you don't have much, then don't think that that's where God wants you either. Because at the end of the day, it's about the the reality of what your heart is doing and what is in your heart. 
And I hope and pray that we can deposit these words in our hearts today. When we ask this question, is enough and when is it enough for you? When is enough enough for you and for me? And we're going to look at one of those lessons today through a man who I am so grateful for today. His name is David. And it addresses the matter of the heart. And let me tell you why it's a matter of the heart. Because some of you might say, Pastor, money has nothing to do with the heart. A lack of money has nothing to do with the heart. Let me say to you this morning that when you look at the core of your heart, you find out so much about who you are. In fact, I just wrote some things down just to kind of give you an idea of why this is so important. Here's what we know about all of us. If you look at the core of your heart, you will know whether or not you are a giving person or whether you're a greedy person. At the core of your heart, you will know the type of person you are. You will find at the core of your heart whether you're a person who is secure or insecure. It's the core of your heart. It's in your heart that you find a person who is very angry or a person who is very patient. It's at the core of your heart. At the core of your heart, you find a person who is full, full of faith or full of doubt. It's all at the core of your heart. And I think at the core of your heart, you find a person who is rich or a person who is poor. It's always been and it always will be at the core of your heart. So this morning, as we seek his face and we seek his word today, Let us bow our heads and let's ask the Lord just to speak to us right now, wherever it is that we're at, and let him speak to the core of your heart today about who you are. Father, Lord, we come to you today and there there are so many of us in this room today that we find ourselves at different places in our lives. And for some who are here today, Lord, there are some who have been given so much and have such an abundance And Father, they love you. And Lord, you have blessed them. There are some who are here today, Lord, who are struggling from one week to the next. And oh, Father, we know that you love them. At the end of the day, Lord, what really matters is what's at the core of our heart. Are we content with what we have? Or do we just have that hunger for more and more and more? And more of the right thing is a good thing, but more of the wrong thing, Lord, it can destroy our lives. So, Father, I pray for each of us here today that, Lord, as we ask that question, when is enough enough? That, Father, we'd not only be able to answer that, but we would answer it in the correct way that honors you. And we ask, Lord, that you just now, through your Holy Spirit, speak. That, Father, you move up and down each and every pew. And, Lord, convict our hearts wherever it needs to be convicted. Father, encourage us wherever we must need encouraged. We ask it, Lord, today because we know that you can and you will. And, Father, it's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. How many of you remember the good old days when... McDonald's and Burger Chef used to go head-to-head in competition with one another. Anybody remember those days? Yeah. I was never a McDonald's fan. I was always a Burger Chef fan. The reason why I didn't like McDonald's very well was because I always remember going there and my grandmother never would buy me this thing. They called it a Happy Meal. You guys remember those? They're still there today. I heard this story not too long ago, and I said, oh, at some point down the line, this has got to apply to us. So I'm going to tell you a story, and I want you to imagine that this story is in the form of a book, a book that could be published and be sold. And and I want to ask you to consider whether or not you think that this book could be sold, and do you think lots of people would buy it, okay? The story is told of this young girl, very young in age, And she went to her father and to her mother and she said, Mom and Dad, please, just, you know, I would be so content. I'd be so grateful. I would not ask for anything else in this whole entire world if I could just have a Happy Meal. 
If I could just have a happy meal, I will never complain about another thing. I'll be content until the day that I die. And the father looked at the daughter and said, I'm not buying you a happy meal. You don't need a happy meal. He knew that it wouldn't bring her contentment. But the more she went on, she said, I won't ask for one thing, Father. Not another thing will I ask for if you just buy me a happy meal. They said, well, maybe this will be a good life lesson. So he bought her a happy meal. And she enjoyed it. She celebrated it. It brought her peace and tranquility. It brought her all the things that she thought that it would. And you know what the crazy thing was about it? That this young girl grew up. And she never asked for another thing. Now, it's not that because that her life was so great. She married a guy that wasn't so good. In fact, they had three children together. He left her. But she never complained because she was content. Because a long, long time ago, she had a Happy Meal. Now, her children, they weren't much better. I mean, they used her. They abused her. They took from her all the time. But you know what? She never complained. Because why? Because she had a Happy Meal. She didn't have a lot of money. She, had, she lived on uh, food stamps for most of her life because she was so uh, distraught over the, well, she was distraught because of the people that left her, but she was never discontent. She was, she was happy because at one time in her life, her father took her through the drive-thru and she had a happy meal. Now I want to just stop and ask you a question. If we were to publish that book, and of course we'd have to add some stuff to it, how many people do you think would buy that book? Any? One copy, maybe, only out of, out of pity for somebody who wrote the book? Because the reality is, you and I know, right? You and I aren't stupid. I mean, we think about our kids and we say, come on, you're not going to get great joy out of a Happy Meal. Once you get the Happy Meal, just a few minutes later, the toy's going to break anyway, and it's not going to be worth it. But, but our kids just think, that's it. That Happy Meal will do it. And we just pray that when our kids get older, that they get smarter, right? But you know what the problem is? Is that as we get older and we get smarter, as adults, we're still looking for a Happy Meal. They just cost a lot more, don't they? The things that you long for, the thing that you think, if I could just have this, or if I could just grasp a hold of that, if I could just make this much more, if I could just have that much in my bank, that I would be happy. See, it's not a big price to pay when you go through a drive-thru and you buy a Happy Meal. But as you get older, you find out the same problems apply. Not just because of your age, but because of something that is lacking in your heart. A peace and a contentment. So this morning, we want to talk about that. In fact, here's what I want you to know this morning. I want you to know that for some of you who are here today, you've got to ask yourself the question, do I have enough? It's the question that you've got to ask. You've got to ask the question because I think that for most of us, the answer to that question is, could we just have just a little more? I think the one thing that you hear from people over and over and over again is not that do I need a lot, I just need just a little more. If I could have just a little bit more money, then I would be happy. If I could have just a little bit more hair, I'd be happy. For some of you, it's a problem. But I don't want to talk about that. Remember, we're not talking about that today. For some of you, it's a, if I could just lose a little weight, if I could just gain a little weight, if I could just have a little bit more, I'd be happy. See, David was one of those great Bible heroes. David was a man who, like so many that we read about in Scripture, that God blessed in an abundant way. But guess what? David was also one of those men who fell into that trap of, I just need a little more. And that's what I want us to look at today. You see, in this story that you and I are going to look at today, David himself is on top of his house, a beautiful house, overlooking all that God had given to him. And he looks across and he sees a woman. Now it's not that David didn't have wives, because he had many. But he looks and he sees this one woman on top of her house and she's taking a bath. And David gets his eye caught and he starts thinking about this woman. And so he looks and he says, she is so beautiful. And he tells one of his servants, bring her over to my house. And one thing, 
leads to another thing, and she gets pregnant. Now, you need to understand that one of the things that was happening here was that there was war that was taking place at this time. And normally a king would be out, to, out to, with his army out to war, but David did not go. David found himself in a place where he was admiring all that he had, and yet all that he had was not quite enough. And so now David has this problem because out of the blue, here comes this woman. Her name is Bathsheba. This is the woman that he has this relationship with. And oh, by the way, she's married. Now her husband, his name is Uriah. And he is out at war. And he is out doing what God had called them to do. And he finds out, David finds out, that she's pregnant. Now what happens now? Because when you put it all together, the reality of it is that when Uriah comes home, there's going to be a problem because he hasn't been home in a while. And how did she get pregnant? So David has a dilemma. What do I do? Because I don't want to look bad. This thing could come back to make me look kind of on the negative side. So what do I do? I have to have a plan. So he devises a plan. And he says, hey, bring Uriah home. And let him spend some time at home for a little bit with his wife. And that would be enough. Give him a break from the war so he comes home. But you know what Uriah does? He doesn't stay with his wife overnight. You know what he does? He sleeps on the porch with the dogs. And the next day, David finds out that he didn't sleep with his wife. That he, 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 he was an honorable man. He was a man who said, it is not right for me to be at home with my wife while my brothers are out fighting in a war I need to be at. He was a man of great honor. So now David's in a dilemma. What do I do now? What's, what's the right thing to do now? So he says, take Uriah, put him back into the battle, and when the archers begin to, 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 uh, to, to put back their bows and they start to, the, to, to, to fight, pull back and let Uriah be out by himself. And Uriah died, just as David had planned. And then David takes Bathsheba to be his own wife. And they have a child. And one thing we're going to learn in just a little bit is, is that that child dies because of, of his sin. But I want to read to you a story that is so powerful that it's one of those messages that I've given just based upon this alone, this little passage that I'm about to read to you now. It's a story of a friend who comes to David. His name is Nathan. And he tells David a story. And I'd like for you to just listen to the story as I read it. And I want you to see with me this morning just how detailed this story is. As David describes something that has happened that looks so much like who David is. It comes from 2 Samuel chapter 12. And if you want to follow along in your Bible, you can. But it's 2 Samuel chapter 12. And beginning with verse 1. And this is what it says. So David says, I have a story to tell you. And here it is. There were two men in a certain town. One rich and the other poor. So now you get this picture. Now Nathan is telling a story. And the story really is about a man named David and about a man named Uriah. A rich man and a poor man. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle. He had a lot of stuff. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb. One little ewe lamb that he had bought. This is Uriah and his one little wife. Not multitudes of wife, but just one. And he raised it. And it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now, as you read that, you can tell that this is much more than just a pet that's outside, right? This is a story of a relationship. Verse 4. Now, a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead... Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. And you can imagine now David is listening to this story and you can imagine how aggravated he would become at the thought that this man who had so much would take away from a man who had so little. 
So David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. So you imagine, David makes these remarks. And then Nathan says one of the most powerful statements I've ever read in Scripture. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Can you imagine? Can you imagine those words as David has looked at the story, has looked at the situation, and he looks at it from the outside and he says, how terrible could a man be that he would do such a thing to a man who has so little? And now David is pointed to by Nathan and he says, David, you're the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. And now we're hearing God's voice. Now we're hearing God's word. And look at what he says. I anointed you king over Israel. And I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you, I gave your master's house to you. And your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, if it had been not enough for you, David, I would have given you even more. Why did you desire, why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. <laughs> and that's the picture of David. And the good news is, can I just tell you this morning, the good news is that in that moment when David was confronted, David got down on his knees and he repented. Now, were there consequences? Absolutely. This baby dies, and now David has to repent. David will always will remember what has happened. But because of his repentance, David begins to serve God again. And I just want to say something to you this morning that's not in my notes, but I want to make sure that we're clear today. You see, it's not sin that destroys God's people. It's not it's unresolved sins that destroy God's people. David could have chose to do whatever he wanted to do. He had the power to reject Nathan. He had the power to even take Nathan's life. But David looked at the situation and he realized that he had sinned. And the thing that he must do, the thing that he had to do, was to repent. Folks, I think we live in a world today where we are not geared or ha even have a desire to repent from the things that we do because of pride. Can you imagine what David's life would have been like if he had never repented? Can you imagine the, the burden that he would have carried his entire life knowing what he had done? Well, this morning, folks, I want to spend some time and I want to talk to all of us this morning about what we can do to increase our immune system to fight against this horrible disease that we call just a little bit more. Because for David, that's exactly what he saw. It was just a little bit more. If I could just have her, if I could just have that, that would be enough. And enough is never enough. So this morning, I want to talk about just a few things this morning. Actually, three words today that I think that are very important for you and I to realize. So if you have your notes this morning, would you just please write these three things down? They're very simple but they matter so much. The first is this. If you want to have a heart that is immune from that kind of junk, the first thing we need to understand is this word that we call gratefulness. Gratefulness. It's a spirit that develops in the heart. It's not something that is automatic. It's something that we are taught. It's what we teach our children when they're little. It's like when the grandparents bring a grandchild forward and say, here, honey, here's some candy. And they grab it and they run away. And what does mom and dad always say? Tell grandpa, tell grandma, what? Thank you. It's something that we learn. There is a difference between this thing called appreciation and a thing that we call gratefulness. Appreciation is something that often happens after you have received something. Gratefulness often happens before anyone does anything at all for you. To have a spirit of gratefulness is something that we say to ourselves that nothing has to be given to us for us to be grateful. Appreciation is something that is often given or shown after something that has been placed in your hands. Can I tell you that the Word of God speaks about the negativity of a person who is not grateful? 
In fact, let me just read to you this morning, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Paul speaks about the man who is without thankfulness, without gratefulness. And these are some strong words from Paul, let me tell you this morning. He says this in verse 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him or, or as God, nor gave thanks to him. They knew him, or they said they knew him, but they didn't glorify him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. <laughs> Imagine that. God is saying how important it is that we become grateful people. So can I just ask you a question this morning? Have you ever been around people who were ungrateful? Have you ever been around people who were ungrateful? Don't they just smell? Isn't there something about them that just stinks up the place? There is such a difference about being around a person like that. In fact, let me just tell you, I do not believe that I would be your pastor today if I did not visit Walmart. Because I think I come up with more stories because of my experience of Walmart than anything else. Let me just tell you, this was just a few weeks ago. And I was standing in line at Walmart, and this, this young lady was trying to buy some of these cards, these prepaid cards, and they weren't going through. And I don't think it was the cashier's fault, but he was having a line that was building up. And you know, now that at Walmart, you have this pickup service, there's only a few people at the cash registers. So here's this man, and he's really struggling, and he's got this big, long line. And so now it's my time to come up, and I'm putting stuff on the conveyor. Now, for those of you who have lived longer, do you remember the days that they would bag your stuff and then put your stuff in your cart? Okay, now they have the rotating table there that they expect that once they put your stuff in the bag that you put it into your car. Okay, you know the routine. Okay, so here's the deal. I felt bad for the guy. And I felt bad that he had this big long line. So after I would take the bag and put it in my cart, I would start to open up the bag so that he wouldn't have to do it when it got around to the next time, right? Can you picture that in your head? So the guy looks at me. And he stops dead in his, in his steps and he points his finger at me and he says, don't open the bags because you're going to tear the bags when you open them. I will do that. <laughs> okay. I said, did I tear one of the bags? No, but you could. <laughs> and I'm thinking like, isn't there like 20 checkout services over here where they expect you to learn to open the bags on your own and put them in? I didn't know what to say. I told my wife about it, and she had some ideas about what I should have said, but... <laughs> no, she did. I'm just teasing about that part. But I was so dumbfounded, I just said, okay. And I went about my business. But in that moment, there was something about this ungratefulness that just stunk. But can I tell you, have you ever been around people who are grateful? You ever been around people who are so grateful that no matter what their circumstances were, they were just so content, they were just so happy? There's a story about a young boy, his name was David Ralstein. Anybody ever heard that name before? You might have heard about the story, he was nine years old, and his father tried to kill him by putting gasoline on him and burning him to death. The little boy survived. But by age 12, he had had over 70 surgeries. He was interviewed by a reporter, and the reporter said, doesn't it seem like that you have just been robbed of so much of your life? And you would expect that this little boy, 12 years old, has experienced so much that, man, he, he has every right to be ungrateful. And yet, here's what the young man said. He says, but I'm alive, aren't I? And he says, and that is good enough. There is a spirit of gratefulness and there is a spirit of ungratefulness and you and I get to choose it. And how so refreshing is it when you are around people who are grateful? And I say to myself, oh God, teach me to be grateful. Teach me to have a heart of being content that I can be grateful, not because of what I've got or what I'm going to get, but because of what you've already done and it's enough. Can I just tell you that when you have a spirit of gratefulness, it changes your vocabulary. Let me tell you why that that's such, a, such an important statement. Because I just wrote down some of these things this morning, and I think some of you are going to be able to use this in your everyday life.
I think that your vocabulary changes when you become a person who's grateful. Things like this, I don't have to serve, I get to serve, right? When you come to church, you don't have to go to church, you get to go to church. When you are a person who has a grateful heart, you no longer look at it as something you have to do, but you get to do. I don't have to give. I get to give. I don't have to worship. I get to worship. I don't have to listen to Pastor Dave preach. I get to hear Pastor Dave preach. But hold on. My wife said this to me just the other day. She said, but remember, honey, that when you get home, you don't have to take out the trash. You get to take out the trash. <laughs> I hate it when I tell her about my sermons. Wives, feel free to use that anytime you want. That's a freebie. So part of understanding what a person is who, who, who finds himself being content and not having to answer that question just a little more. It starts with a gratefulness. It starts with gratefulness of heart. The second thing that you have to have is this. It's righteousness. It's a word that's not about what you get. And that's the hard part because we get confused with that. It's not about what you get, but how you get it. Let me just explain what I mean by that. God was, is concerned about the how so much more than about the, the what. Because you remember what he said to, to David back when we were just reading that story? He said, but here's why in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 7, he says this. He says, I anointed you. Do you remember that, David? I anointed you king over Israel. And I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, if it wasn't enough, I would have given you even more. <laughs> See, it's not about the what, it's the how. The how is, the, is really from the who. In fact, Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 tells us this. But seek first his kingdom and what? His what? Righteousness. And all these things, he says, will be given to you as well. <laughs> and let us be reminded, and I said this to my Sunday school class this morning, if you want Bible blessings, and I think we all do, I mean, we want the blessings of what the Bible says, right? If you want that, you have to do it the Bible way. So many, so many of us in our congregations today, they want the blessings of the Bible, but they want to do it their way. And when it doesn't happen, they blame God and wonder why God didn't show up. Why did God not do what he said he would do? And let me just tell you, folks, you want the blessings of God. You want his righteousness. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you as well. God knows, folks. God knows that we all have an appetite. He's not, he's not silly about that kind of stuff. But how we meet that appetite is so very important. How many times I've had husbands and wives sit in my office and the husband talk about his marriage and how he's done. It's over. He doesn't want to deal with it anymore because he's found somebody else and he's found love somewhere else. He's found a friend somewhere else. He's found somebody to love somewhere else. And I just want you to know, folks, that's where we find ourselves in trouble because now we've done it our way. The how is the most important thing. We never look and say, but God, change my marriage change what I have now and make it like it was in the beginning. We look at relationships and we blow relationships off because we don't want to do it the way God calls us to do it. See, the how is where we allow God to, to do the work, not for us to do it our own way. Let me just tell you this morning, I've got some, I've got some big time issues because to have righteousness in your heart, you must consider two things. So write these two things down. You have to consider the source. If you truly want righteousness, you've got to consider the source. Where does it come from? Is it from the flesh? Is it from the enemy? Or is it from the hand of God? Because see, let me tell you this morning, God can give you, uh, God, the devil can give you what you want. Did you know that? He can give you lots of stuff. But if you do it his way, you get his kind of response. You get his kind of ending. But if you do it God's way, it's a whole different thing. Because Satan can give you wealth. 
In fact, let me just remind you in Luke chapter 4 verse 6, de the devil says to Jesus and he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, Satan says, and I can give it to anyone I want to. <laughs> so let me tell you this morning, if you will compromise, then you'll play the right, then you'll play right into Satan's hands. If you compromise, you're right where Satan wants you. You have to remember the source. The second thing, if you want righteousness in your heart, you've also got to consider the consequences. Because there are. Because you can get things on your own. In fact, one of my favorite people in history was Abraham Lincoln. And at one time, he was about to give a speech. And by the way, if you don't know this about Abraham Lincoln, he was one of those articulate speakers. He could really pull people in. You ever met people like that, that when they spoke, everybody listened? I mean, they were easy to persuade people to do whatever they, they called them to do. That's the kind of man Abraham Lincoln was. And Abraham Lincoln knew that if on his own, he called people to do things, that they would do it. But Abraham, being a man of God, said this before he got on stage one day. And I read this, and it didn't make sense to me at first, but let me please reiterate this to you. Before he got on stage to speak to a large multitude of people, Abraham Lincoln prayed this prayer, and this is what he said. He said, without God, I must fail. Now, you've heard people say this before. Without God, I will fail. Can I tell you that there is a difference between those two statements? Without God, I must fail. He says this. He's saying, I can get people to listen to me, and I don't need God. But without God, he says, I want to fail. He says, without God, Lord, make me fall on my face, because without you, Lord, it does not matter. Can you, do, do you pray like that? I mean, I, I sometimes think, Lord, some of the things that I say on the platform, some of the stories, some of the jokes— God, did you really want me to say that? I don't think so. But Lord, at the end of the day, Lord, if it's what you want, then I pray that I have a heart like Abraham Lincoln who said, I must fail. I want to fail. If it's not you, then let it not be anything at all. Can I just tell you this morning that in Psalm 84, verse 10, is a statement that we read, and it sounds so beautiful, it sounds so flowerly, but let me just read it to you and make sense of this with, the, uh, with all of us together here. In Psalm 84, verse 10, it says this, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of of the wicked. I would rather be in one day in your court than to be a thousand elsewhere. Why? Because of who it is. Because if it doesn't come from God, then it's just not worth it. If it doesn't come from God, it just doesn't matter. If you want righteousness, then you must consider those two things. And last, here it is. If you want to answer that question without saying again and again, I need just a little more, you also need this. You need nearness. Would you just write that down? When you're near to God, you're not scrambling for more. When you're near to God, you have all you need in him. David who was a part of the story that we just read about a moment ago. David, who looked at Bathsheba and just wanted a little bit more, said these same words in Psalm 65, verse 4, when he said this, Blessed are those you choose and what bring near to live in your courts. We are filled, and some of your translations say satisfied. We are satisfied with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. So you can have all the things of this world, but if you're not near to God, you won't be satisfied with it. I wrote down some things, and this list is very short. But I thought about this, 
And I thought about what it means when you and I are near to God, when we are satisfied or we are filled because we are near to the one who gives us what we need. And I thought about this. You and I will never be satisfied with church if we're not near to God. If you're not near to God, then you go into church as just checking off a checklist of I participated with some kind of corporate worship today. I did what I had to do. You will never experience true worship in the way that you need to if you're not near to God. What happens when you and I stand here together this morning and we sing songs about Jesus? Those words will never be more than just words unless you're near to God. Here's a couple more. I preach about once a year on giving. And do you know why? Because I know that when I preach about being near to God, your giving will be something that you want to do, not something that you have to do. If I talk about money for four weeks in a row, is it going to really change your heart? I don't think so. But if I can get you to draw near to God, if I can allow you to look at your heart and see that which is far from him and you find closeness to him, you'll be satisfied and giving will be something that you will not have to do. You'll want to do it. And the last is this. At this time of the season, and you don't have to raise your hands, but there are relationships that you have to be around people this year, at this time of the year, that you really don't want to. But when you're near to God, those relationships could be different. You don't have to be around them. You get to be around them. It's a choice. You get to choose. Now, some of you are saying, but you don't know my family. I don't. But you don't know mine either. And it's not always easy. But I can tell you this, that people like David and people like Abraham and people like Isaac, these are men who had much. And when they were near to God, those things didn't matter because they were near to God. And whatever they had was more than sufficient. But when they were walking away from God, they were always hungry for more. And for those people who were poor, and they were near to God, they were content, and they were happy because they were near to God. But when they weren't near to God, they were always looking for that next best thing. They were always looking for that happy meal, that next experience that will give them what they hope that it will. And you already know the outcome and the answer to that. When you're near to Him, there is contentment, there's gratefulness. And we can have that as a church too. But we have to choose Him. You may be able to get stuff on your own, but those things don't matter if you don't have gratefulness, if you don't have righteousness, if you don't have nearness. You've got to have those things or you will never be content. I don't care if you are rich or middle class or poor. It will not matter if you don't experience those things with him. So here we are at Christmas getting ready for that. And you got a list. You got things you want. You got things you got to have. And I pray that you find first and foremost that you are content because of who you have. Who you have. I pray that for you. I pray that for me too. So would you stand this morning? I pray two things. I pray God that will open his heart, his heart to you. He will. And I pray that you open your heart to him. And I pray that you'll give those things over to him that you do not need. Those things that drive you every single day. For some of you, you, you do what you do. You work for what you work for. For stuff that just doesn't matter. And I pray that God will remind you that with him, you'll never have to fear and worry about just one more thing or just a little bit more. I don't care where you're at. And I also pray for you this morning that God will help you to work every day to be satisfied in Him and in Him alone. And that if you want Bible blessings, oh, how I pray that you'll do it the Bible way. And when that happens, you can look back and you can say, oh, how good and faithful my God is. I promise you that today. So this morning, let's sing together. I want you to know that if you want to pray, the altars are open. If you want to deal with it right where you're at, you can. 
But let these words, these words that we sing, and oh, by the way, can I just tell you, here lately, my heart has been so convicted over the words that we sing. Sometimes I think, oh Lord, do I really mean the things that come out of my mouth when we sing together? I gotta be honest with you. There are some times that I've sung some of the words and I've said to myself, oh man, that's convicting. I'm saying it with my lips, but in my heart, it's not true. So this morning, as we sing together, let the words that we say, make sure it's, it's in your heart. Otherwise, it's just singing songs, right? Because you have to. Not because you get to. Let's sing together this morning. For some of you who don't know, Steve Moore, who you may or may not know him, um, he's the guy who hands out candy at the end of service, in case you're wondering, was told last week that the chemo that he's taken will not help the cancer that he has. And he has only six months to a year to live. This week, I went to visit Steve. It was on a Wednesday. He's never going to leave the room that he's in. Where is he at? It's where he'll be. And this song popped into my head while I was leaving. And specifically one part of the song. It was the part that we just sung about when my time grows near and I'm at the end of my life. What will I be doing? I thought about the last things that he'll experience in his life on this earth. The people that he'll gather with for the last time at Thanksgiving and at Christmas. And every day will be the last day of something for him. And I've watched his spirit be so powerful and so bold and so full of gratefulness. And he's only in his 50s. And I thought about, I thought about time with my family at Thanksgiving. And I thought about my time at Christmas with my family. And I thought, Lord, what if the news came for me? What if it was for someone in our church? How would we respond in those moments to know that this could be the end for us? What would I do? And how would I respond? And I want it to be more than just words that are spoken on Sunday morning. I want it to be more than just a song. I want it to be my heart. I want it to be a heart of praise of knowing that it is okay because God is faithful. And I can receive the Bible blessings because we've done it the Bible way. And that's what I pray for us too. So this morning as we have sung together many songs, can I just tell you, I think I have been more convicted this morning in the words that we have sung together than anything else that we've done today. And I pray that you have too. And I pray that it allows you to look at your heart in a brand new way. To take seriously the thing that you call your faith. That that faith matters so much. That even when you don't get what you want or you don't get enough of what you think you need. You have a heart of gratefulness. You have a heart of righteousness. That you have a heart that is near to God. I pray that for you and I pray that for me because the time will come for us too and we need to decide. So Father, this morning, we thank you in advance for all that you have given to us. To some you have given much and to some you have given less, but to all you have given love and you have given hope. And to all you have give, been given the gift of salvation to us and that, Lord, we're grateful for today. And I praise you, Lord, for that. And I praise you, Lord, that in our hearts that that truly is enough, that we don't need one more thing, that we can be content with what we have been given because salvation is already afforded to every single one of us. A hope for 10,000 years beyond this time and forevermore has been promised to us and all we have to do is receive it. 
So Father, this morning, enough is enough for us. You have, do, you have given and done more than we ever deserved. So Father, today we praise you. We give you the glory today for all that you have done, for all that you have done for us. We thank you. We praise you, Lord, and draw us ever nearer every single day that we too may say, sing these words with confidence and boldness to know that we mean what we say when we say it. Father, we love you today. And it's in your precious and wonderful name that we pray. All God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Be, have a wonderful day in the Lord today.